us now in Jesus name if you agree with that prayer say amen. amen amen praise God turn your hands shake hands with one more person and then you may be seated and of course if you're joining us right now on Facebook we want to welcome you we thank God for you being here today Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father and uh, you know we encourage you it could be very easy for you to be distracted um, because you're not physically here, but I believe that this word is just as much for you as it is for each and every one of us. Uh, so give an ear to hear what the Spirit of God will say to you, and we know that you will be blessed. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude a series that I started five weeks ago called Overcoming the Obstacle. And I truly believe this has been a, a profound word from God for each and every one of us. I wanted to tag this series as a relationship series. Even more so, I wanted to minister this series to marriages. Being a person that's married, um, there can be obstacles in between you and where you intend to be in your life and in your marriage. But something in me kept going beyond relationships and going beyond marriages, that this was just as much about each of us individually, that as you see in the graphic, that between you and your next level, there could be obstacles that are literally preventing you or trying to keep you from the better life that God intends for you to have. And so as we have taken the text in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll conclude it today. Verse 15 said that we are to look carefully unless any one of us falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And so this has been the foundational text, the platform from which we've preached, and I want you to examine it and take it to heart. God is literally saying to you to be careful to look into your life unless there is something in you that messes you up. And then when it messes you up, it messes, the people, messes up the people that's closest to you. And so he literally calls it a root of bitterness. And a root of bitterness can cause you to fall short of the grace of God. None of us can afford to fall short of the grace of God. Everything we have is but by the grace of God. I don't know if there is a more important subject in the New Testament than the subject of grace. Literally, grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, it's God giving you something that you don't deserve. And if truth be told, none of us deserve to be here. I know some of you are like me that grew up in the church, but that doesn't mean that I've been in my lifetime without sin. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, no matter how big or small you call your sin. It deserved the death penalty. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he has loved us, he picked us up in Jesus and he's given us his grace. By grace we are saved and that through faith and not of works unless any man should boast. So everything, and I mean everything we have in life is because of God's grace. We're saved, healed, delivered, preserved, prospered all by the grace of God. So to literally stumble and fall short of the grace of God is to miss out on what he has given you. It's to fall short of it, to not walk in the fullness of it. As a result of falling short of the grace of God, we experience sickness and disease and poverty and lack and turmoil in relationships. Why? Because we don't have that measure of grace upon us. We've, we've fallen short of grace. And so he says, because it's so important, I want you to look very carefully in your life for this thing called the root of bitterness, because it can trip you up. 
and cause you problems. Um, I was walking through my yard, and where we live, there's two big pine trees in the front yard particularly, one in the back. And if you know, if you know anything about a pine tree, every now and then they'll send out one of those big roots, and it'll come to the surface. And unless you cut it out, of course, it can grow and send another part, but unless you cut it out, it could absolutely be a trip hazard in your own yard. Have you ever been walking and trip over something? And that's what this root of bitterness is. It is something that can absolutely trip you up. And he says, make sure you steer clear of it. So in overcoming the obstacles, there's five different parts of this. The first two were about you. Um, somebody said that the enemy is really inner me. And it's not the people around us that's keeping us from promotion and from a better life. Oftentimes, it's us that's messing us up, right? You know, we have the tendency, like Adam, it's the woman you gave me. She's the one that's calling me all the trouble, right? And we have the tendency, like, like the woman, the devil made me do it. Come on, somebody. The serpent, he gave me the fruit and I did eat. You know, we want to shift the blame rather than dealing with what's going on wrong that's on the inside of us. So we, we dealt with that in the first two parts. But then we dealt with this big subject called history. History can be an obstacle. And then last week, ah, man, I so enjoyed it, talking about Babel, the Tower of Babel, but specifically bad communication, poor communication, or miscommunication can be used as an obstacle that keeps you from the better life that God intends for you to have. The last one today is money. Overcoming the obstacle of money. Now, obviously, money in and of itself is neither bad nor good, but the enemy will use money, as we're about to see, to keep you from reaching the next level in life. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, and verse 10, the scriptures clearly says that the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So when I went home last week, I, I, I knew, I've known for weeks that money would be a part of this message and that it would be, because I've seen it in marriages. Um, particularly, uh, I, we're, we're doing a Dave Ramsey series in, uh, on Thursday nights, Financial Peace University, and I didn't know this particular statistic, but he said it and said it several times, and it's just alarmed my thinking. Dave Ramsey says that 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. What that means is, is that most of us in here are just one event shy from a financial crisis. And there might be some of us in here who had that event and are now in a financial crisis. Why? Because one way or another, money is an obstacle from us living a peace-filled life that God intended. 78%. Somebody say 78%. He also mentioned that the top listed cause of divorce is money problems. An obstacle of money that's intentionally used by the enemy to destroy what you and your wife intended to build from the day that you started it. He uses that. So, I knew, and, and I've, I've counseled, and I've, I've lived, and I've experienced life for, for years, and I know that money is an obstacle that the enemy used. But what I did not connect that the Spirit of God brought to me last week was this verse of Scripture. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is really the verse that God wants to minister and breathe into your heart today. He says, for the love of money is the root. When I saw that, it was supernaturally profound. In other words, 
I didn't learn this in a Bible school. I didn't learn this, you know, listen to somebody else preach. It was as if God was saying, not only is there a root of bitterness that can spring up and trouble you, there's a root of evil called the love of money that can spring up and cause you trouble. And as a result, many in your life be defiled. Now, money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. A lot of times when you quote this or you hear this quoted, it's often misquoted. People say that, well, you, well, you know, you know you, you hear somebody that has some money and something bad happened to them. Or you see somebody and some famous and, you know, they're living in an extravagant life and, you know, they have wealth and riches. And, and sometimes Christians will pop up and say, well, you know, money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the Bible says. Because you can commit this crime and not have a dime. I mean, you could be broke and still have a love for money. So what I submit to you today and my challenge for you, knowing that the enemy wants to use money as an obstacle between you and your next level, I want to challenge you from this perspective. Do you love money? How do you determine that? How do you determine, you know, because immediately if you're like me, if I was sitting in the church service and the message came forth, immediately I would think, well, that's not me. I don't love money. I love God. And I know there's so many of us sitting here and listening online that would immediately come to the conclusion that that's not me, that I don't love money. But God says, hold on, be careful, look diligently to make sure that you don't love money. So in other words, there shouldn't be a quick answer to this. We should ask ourselves, how do I determine if I love money so I can make sure that it doesn't trip me up? Because if I read this correctly, if we run it backwards, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some in the church have coveted after, they have erred from living by faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done something, bought something, and later regretted it? Then could it be that the love of money was somehow involved because you did that to you? And now you're sorry as a result of it. So my assignment today is to help you to identify what loving money looks like, and also then to show you how to keep from loving money. So how important is money to you? Do you love money? (laughs) Thank you for your honesty. (laughs) Somebody might say, I love money. Money, 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 money. Money, 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 money. (laughs) If you're like me, I check my accounts every single day of my life. Off day included. All throughout the day, if you're like me. You can say I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Help me now. So how do you determine if you love money? Well, how important is this to you? As you can see, you can love it and not have a dime. So, so many of us are right here. And I don't want you to misunderstand. God is not against you having money. And if you have shaped your mind to think that that, you know, all people that are rich are not going to go to heaven, Jesus said this and that, then you've really shaped your mind in a wrong way. The Bible says the love of money, not money. Money is neither good nor bad, 
But God is not against you having money. How do you know that? Well, I know that because of what the word says. For example, in the book of Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22, um, the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. One translation says it makes you rich. So not just in a generic term, if God blesses you, that blessing on your life will cause wealth, riches and money to come into your hands. But there's something different about when God does it than when you do it, because when you do it, you pierce yourself through with many sorrows. But when God causes you to get money, he adds no, come on, sorrow with it. So we would then have to, you know, immediately and quickly conclude that God is not against you having money, but he is against money having you. Come on, you've got to understand that because it'll help you determine if you love money or if you, it'll help you to identify if there is any love of money in you. He's not against you having money. But is it possible that, 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 that you, you, money can have you? Oh, absolutely. It can rule your life. How do you know that, that, that it, God's not against you having money? The Bible says in another place, I can go throughout the scripture again, line upon line, I don't have time. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18, he says, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant as he swear, which he swear unto your fathers as it is this day. Who is it that gave you that job? Who is it that caused that promotion? Who is it that gave you the wisdom to set up that retirement account? Who is it that helped you get that car, get that house? It's but by the grace of God. So in truth, God's not against you having money. Matter of fact, he'll give you the power to get wealth. But with it comes a warning. He says, now, I'm giving this to you, but don't love it. I don't want this to have you. I want you to have this. Amen? So with that in mind, let me show you the individual that the Lord brought to my attention through the scripture to help you. How do, how do you determine what it looks like to love money? There's a story of a young man in Mark chapter 10. I want you to find yourself in this passage. You know, for example, if you said, um, you know, Pastor Stan, could you look in your closet for a typewriter? I don't have a typewriter. I don't need to look in the closet for the typewriter because I don't have a typewriter. How many of y'all know you're not going to look something, look for something that you don't believe that you have? I got to let this sink in. Because if you quickly conclude that you don't have the love of money, then you're not going to look carefully for it. I'm not going to move everything in my closet looking for a typewriter. Matter of fact, by a show of hands, is there anybody that still owns a typewriter? Oh, bless your heart. Sister Deborah still owns a typewriter. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But you're not going to look for something that you don't believe you have. Right? So don't override this. Slow down. Identify yourself. See if you can see any evidences in you in this story. So one day there was this guy that came to Jesus. And as Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt down before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said, teacher, all these things I have done and kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loving him, said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And the young man was sad at his word. 
and went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions. Now I beg to differ. He didn't go away sad because he had great possessions. He went away sad because great possessions had him. How do you determine that they had him? Because he couldn't let it go. Mm, come on, somebody. When he had the opportunity to. So in asking yourself the question, how do you determine if you love money? The question is, can you give it away? If you can give it away, then you can say you don't love it. Why? Because if you love it, then you can't give it away. You know how it is. Your friend came over to help you clean out some stuff, and you were like, oh, yeah, girl, you don't need this. Oh, man, you don't need this. And man, we can give this to the good one. You're like, hold on, brother. No, we're going to keep that, and we can move these other. Y'all got to help me now. Don't leave me out here by myself. You know how it is when you love something and don't want to get rid of it. There's a lot of things in your life that you should really let go. But for some reason, you're still tied to it. Why? There's an affection there. And you can't let it go. How do you determine if you love money? Can you give it away? This young man loved money. How do you know? Because Jesus gave him an opportunity of a lifetime. You can literally count on your hands how many times Jesus said directly to a person, come, take up your cross and follow me. He said it to Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Nathan, a handful of disciples, and this young man gets an opportunity to literally be one of Jesus' disciples? I mean, who could know? We know Judas was going to mess up, amen. And they were looking for somebody to replace Judas. If this guy would have gave and did what Jesus said, he could have been Judas' replacement. But because... He loved money more than God. He couldn't obey what God was saying. And that's how we can determine in our lives if we love money is when the word says something and we don't obey it because we want something more than we want what that word says. Amen? Amen. Jesus, right after this, I mean, this is a sad thing. He put a finger right on where this guy was. And when the guy walked away, he said, how hard is it for those that are rich to enter into the kingdom of God? When he said that, the disciples were like astonished. They were like, whoa, Jesus, what you talking about, Jesus? Y'all remember that? Like, what you talking about, Willis? Am I dating myself? Oh, man. What you talking about, Jesus? And he had to explain, he had to break it down. He said in verse 24, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus said it again. He said, children, how hard it is for those who what? Trust in riches. If you had a, a Bible to underline or at least made a, make a mental heart note. He's not talking about people that are rich won't go to heaven. He's talking about people who trust in their riches. How do you know if you trust in your riches? Can you give it away? Oh, man. Can you give it away? Let me go on to my next one. So this one came at about 1 o'clock last night. Wasn't in my thought. You know, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking I'm just going to preach Mark chapter 10 and, and use that as a great example. But no. Then the Lord showed me this scripture in Luke chapter 12 and verse number 15. He said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Now, again, you will not diligently look for something that you don't think you have. And if you make a light effort just because you, you appease somebody and you start to look for it, you won't be diligent if you don't really think you have this. But what I need you to hear is Jesus is asking you to do something. He says, take heed. Somebody say, take heed. Take heed. And beware of covetousness. The word beware means to look out for. Watch out. There's something that can, that, that can cause you some trouble. It's almost as if we're looking at Hebrews 12 again. He says, pay attention to this and beware in yourself 
of this thing called covetousness. Now, I submit to you that during this last week, you did not use the word covetousness in your text message. You didn't use email, you didn't use it in your email about covetousness, no. So it's not a word that we're commonly familiar with, that we're cognitively thinking about. It's not in our everyday vocabulary, but it is something that the Lord is urging you to pay attention to because it can trip you up and mess you up and cause you trouble in your life. So how do you determine if you love money? It brings us to the question of covetousness. So right after he makes this statement, he does what he does. He uses an illustration to help you understand the importance of what he is saying. He tells them a story. This didn't really happen. This was like a parable. It's like a story. It says in verse 16 that he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a rich man yielded plentifully. Again, find yourself in this story. Maybe you've got retirement accounts. Maybe you've got investment accounts. Maybe, you know, your, your education really paid off and you're living well and you're sitting comfortably. And, you know, you, you may consider yourself one that, that, that doesn't have a problem or love of money. But notice and see if you can find yourself in this story. Because this guy, he produced well and he got to the place he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? You know how it is when you get to the place in your house where you run out of closet space because you don't give that old suit away. You run out of shoe space because you don't give those older shoes. No, these, these shoes still good. I know what you're talking about. I paid a good pretty penny for these. And, you know, your friend was just talking to you about giving them to the Goodwill. You're like, girl, no, you don't know. Them is mine. I barely wear them. I got stuff in my closet with the tags on it. Y'all got to help me. Now, why y'all bring this kind of stuff out? I didn't say that at all at the 830 service. I know what I need to do. I need to get a bigger place. I need, I need to get a bigger place, right? We running out of space. You know, the kids are getting older, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really? And what makes that any difference than what's going on in this guy's life? He thought within himself, man, what am I going to do? I don't have no room to put my stuff. I know what I'll do. I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build bigger. And there I'll put my stuff and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, so you have, you know you something when you're talking to yourself. <laughs> Self, you are doing all right. <laughs> he said, I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years, yet take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Does this sound like somebody who trusts in what they've accumulated in life? Very much so. And there's a danger there. God says, fool, <laughs> this night your soul will be required of you. Then who things be who you have, which you have a I'm thinking in my mind because I hear this every now and then. You know, say you've never seen a U-Haul hooked up to a hearse. You came into this world naked. And you're going to leave naked. So what does it matter? The accumulation of stuff in life. How important is stuff to you? It'll help identify if you've got a root that'll every now and then trip you up. Okay? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. An individual who's rich toward God, if God says do this, they do it. If God says go here, they obey him. It's almost as if the guy in Mark chapter 10 is very similar to the guy that's in Luke chapter 12. Let's talk about covetousness. Because that was the emphasis as we see here <clears throat> In Luke, he said, beware of covetousness. Now, if I'm not mistaken, thou shalt not covet is one of the Ten Commandments. 
But did you know, so Exodus chapter 20, when we read our chapter this week, Exodus chapter 20 is God giving Moses 10 things that he commands the children of Israel to obey. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven image before me. You shall not make any image of the sea or of, the, of, of heaven. I mean, he breaks it down. He talks about the commandment of promise. Honor your father and your mother. But then the next few commandments, he just shoots them out real quick. Thou shall not murder. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not defraud one another. But then when he gets to, to verse 17, he doesn't just simply say thou shall not covet as a one liner. He broke down really clear what it means to not worship another God or, or grave an image or, or the benefit of honoring your mother and father, but gave a bunch of one liners. But when he gets to this subject of covetousness, he goes off. Why? Because it's dangerous. You could say, this is more dangerous than murder. This is more dangerous than stealing. This is more dangerous than adultery. Why? This will trip you up in life. It's one of the number one. No, I'm not committing adultery. No, I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to murder anybody. But when it comes to covet, there's something about this that you need to watch out for. It'll mess you up. What does it say? He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. Come on, he just went off. <laughs> what is he doing? He's trying to emphasize how easy it is for you to slip over into this thing called covet or covetousness, and he warns you because this can be a root that the enemy uses to knock you out of your race. So what does the word covet mean? I'm glad you asked. This is from Google. <laughs> you know, my two-year-old son, he could say Alexa now. <laughs> so he says, Alexa, E-I-O. <laughs> it means he wants the Alexa to play old McDonald's. Well, Y'all get that. Anyway, so ask Google, right? Google says that. That clears me because I don't have any wrong desires. <laughs> right. The word covet means to desire inordinately. If we were being careful, we'd go through this really slow and look in us. Is there any desire in us that's not ordinary, not for a human being? Is there any desire in us that's not ordinary for a Christian? Ooh, come on, man. Now you're starting to break it down. Is there anything in us that we want without due regard to the rights of others? Do we want somebody else or something that belongs to somebody else? How about this? To covet means to wish for. Well, that probably includes all of us. Right? We wish for something, especially when you eagerly wish for something. What am I doing? I'm trying to help you identify so when you look inside of yourself, if you find yourself longing for, wishing for, or especially eagerly looking for, it could be that that is a love of money that can trip you up in some other area of your life. But how about this? To covet means to want or to want to have something very much. I mean, I'm there. There are things in my life right now that if I were being honest, I would have to tell you, I want that very much. That's what covetousness is. Especially something that belongs to somebody else. It's not limited to, but it's connected to. So what then is the opposite of covetousness? I'm almost done, so uh, worship team, you all can come on up. Um, let me conclude this series with where we started. I remember I was wanting to go play basketball. My mom said we got to clean the weeds out of the cracks in the driveway before we could play. We cleaned them out. Next week, we want to go play basketball. Mom says you got to clean it. We're like, wait, mom, we just did that. Yeah, but they're back up. You're not doing it right. You got to get down there and grab it by the root and pull it out. And that taught me a life lesson. That if you want to get something out, a plant out, 
you can't just pull it off at the top. Right? You've got to identify it at its root. And then you get it out. You can treat it, medicate it, chemically, all of that, and leave it alone. But that's how you pull something up from the roots. One of the toughest trees to remove, this is real in life, is a palm tree. A dear friend of mine reminds me of the scripture all the time that the, those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish like the palm tree. If, you, if you're jumping from church to church to church, your life's not going to flourish the way that God intended it. But when you plant yourself in a church, the winds can blow, look like they can blow you half over, but because you're planted in the house of our God, you'll flourish, you'll spring back up. You'll have bounce back ability, come on. Amen, because you're planted. I remember when somebody asked me to remove a palm tree, and I've, I've cut down trees, I've had stumps ground out, and all that kind of stuff before, but I had never up to that point, I was in Florida, and I, and I cut down a palm tree. I didn't know and I had to ask because this is not normal. I've never seen roots like this. It just looks like a million tentacles, like almost like the roots of grass that grow into the ground. A pine tree, I mean, they send out these massive, uh, there's a tap root that just goes, I mean, yards into the ground. But a palm tree, not that deep. But it's locked in because of all of the intricacies of this root. I learned that the palm tree is like grass, more so than a tree. What am I saying? If you're going to get this out of you, you're going to have to identify it and get it removed. What are we talking about, Pastor? All right, let me help you. How do you keep from loving money? All of us are subject to this. We can want something, something even good, something for our families. But we can try to save our own life and lose it. Or we can lose it and find it. The opposite of covetousness is contentment. Covetous wants to want or to have something very much. That's me. What's the opposite of that? Being okay with what I already got. So what's supernaturally amazing, I didn't have it in my mind when he brought this to me last Sunday after church, when he showed me for the love of money is the root of all evil, something in me, the Holy Spirit told me, go back and read the verses right up to this verse. In 1 Timothy, talking about being content, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 10, it says, but godliness with contentment, being okay with what you have, not wanting anything more. That's great gain. What are you talking about? Why? Because we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us with that be what? Content. What is he teaching us? He's teaching us something very powerful. Not that God is against you having a better car or a better house or a bigger place or a larger reach. No, he wants to bless you with more. But you got to go about it the right way. You know, the richest man that we knew that was blessed of God was Solomon. And God literally told him, because you didn't ask me for wealth or riches or for your enemy's head on a stake, you just simply ask me for wisdom. Not only am I going to make you the wisest man that has ever lived, but I'm also going to give you what you didn't ask me. I'm going to give you wealth and riches beyond what any man could ever imagine. God made Solomon a multi-billionaire. But it wasn't because he wanted that. Was content with what he had. As you comb through your heart in life, make sure the love of money is not there. If you're finding yourself really wanting this, it's going to cause you to do something that you'll later regret. The verse continues. 
But they that will be rich, they that want to be rich, they are going to fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. On Thursday nights, and if you can join me, I really encourage you to do so, I'm teaching a message series called Get Out and Stay Out of Debt. We just taught this past week that debt is a snare. And you know it, it's a trap. You were pulled in by no interest between now and 2020. Same as cash. Right? And so you're thinking everything I got, I can do this. I know it's 42 easy payments. I want this. But you don't have it right now. I got one right. That means I need to talk longer. I really want this, and I want this now. I really want this. But God says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Either he's going to hold to one and hate the other, or despise the one and love the other. You can't serve God and mammon. What is that? Money. Notice, loving God versus loving money or stuff. Come on, talk to me now. You put yourself in a position that God said, don't do it. He said, owe no man anything but to love him. But they that want something, they that love money, Come on, they that are eager to have something that they wish for will fall into a trap called debt. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. He concludes in verse 10. Why? Because the love of money. The lack of contentment. Covetousness in us is the root of all sorts of evil, which while some have stopped living by faith, who are just walking now by what they can see. Because if you were living by faith, you say, well, I don't have the money now for this car, so I can get it on credit. Where God says is what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Well, you can't see by faith physically. You have to see by faith on the inside. And so you're thinking, well, I don't see how I'm ever gonna get this car, especially with this salary that I have. Pay cash for a car? Oh, y'all gotta help me. Y'all got to gotta help me now. What's happening, you're wanting something too much. And you're overextending yourself. And now, now you got marriage trouble because of money. What? Money? Is that important? Did you willing to dump what you one day thought was the love of your life? Of this money thing? Yeah, yeah, the love of money. You love something too much. I see, I, I, I see like I'm so deep into this that I got to just back off. I don't want to lose you. Amen. I hope you come back next week. Amen. <laughs> That church, that church is just too real. I need something. Yeah, I need to feel better when I leave the church. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I need, to, I need to feel better. I don't go to church to feel bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Come back. I'll try to fix something different next week. Number two, in keeping yourself from loving money, be a generous giver. Yeah. See, when Jesus said, let it go, sell what you have give to the poor come again God would have gotten everything that he gave Jesus said there's no man that's given up anything for my sake or for the Gospels who will not in this life receive a hundred times more than they give come on man if you know anything about God you cannot be God giving but if you love money you will not give Judas one day there was this woman can I have a couple extra minutes? I'm like right on time. I know, I know. Well, they took time from us. Amen. So I really should be short, but there was this woman that gave Jesus a gift, a personal gift that was valued at one year's salary. I want you to imagine that you have a savings account somewhere 
and that it's valued at one year's salary, whether for a human being, like 30, 60, $100,000, you put whatever price tag on it. But she gave him a financial gift of one year's salary. When she did that, one of the disciples said, oh, whoa, then why was this wasted? This could have been given to the poor. That was Judas. And the Bible literally says he didn't get all upset because he cared about the poor, but because he held the bag. And what he cared about was how he could have sold it and trimmed off some for himself. Don't be Judas. Don't be Judas. Be a generous giver. Now, obviously, I'm not preaching this message because the church needs money. This is amazing what I've seen. I, I didn't know this was going to be like this. For those of you that don't know, um, we don't pass the offering plate to collect the tithes and offerings. Matter of fact, we had a first time visitor last week who really, really enjoyed the service, by the way. The whole family enjoyed the service. Um, but he mentioned to me this week, hey, how do I give to the church? I was there and I noticed that you didn't pass an offering plate. I said, yeah, there's a little black box in the, in the foyer. And if you want to give, you can feel free to give. I did not know when it came to my heart. I thought that we would make this change. I was doing it by faith. I thought that the tithes and offerings would drop down and that somehow or another I'd be given the opportunity to talk about it, to bring it back up. But we don't make any mention of it. We barely mention that the box exists. But from the time that we stopped passing the plate, the offerings have not only stayed the same, they've gone up. So please don't think that I'm saying what I'm saying so you can give more of your money to the church. If you have a problem with the thought about churches and money, then you need to identify whether that might be the love of money in you. Come on, somebody. God's not like that. Matter of fact, let me show you. In generous, it says be, be a generous giver. Let me tell you exactly how God is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he says, God says, remember this, a farmer who plants a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to what? Give. How do you determine if you have the love of money? Give it away. It'll, deter, it'll let you know, ooh, man, I can't give that away. All right, that just lets you know where you are with that. Amen? But he says, all of us must decide in ourselves how much to give. And don't give reluctantly. Don't give in response to pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver, right? So the, the second thing to keep from loving money, be generous. Be generous. If there's anything in your life that you hit a choke point, ooh, I can't give that much to the church. You ought to be intentional. Ooh, I can't give, ooh, no, I can't give that. Ooh, you know, you ought to be intentional. Because that, oh man, I done ran into a choke point. Because it's saying that you don't believe that God can get it back to you and multiply it in the process. Let me talk about tithing. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to tithe. And I'm so thankful to God that that's true. Maybe about five or six percent in a poll by Barna they say five or six percent of Christians today tithe. The percentage here at Faith Family Church far exceeds that. It is absolutely amazing. People are giving because of the electronic giving. They're giving all throughout the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's amazing. Amen. There are a bunch of tithers at Faith Family Church. But check this out. Not everybody tithes. And the ones that don't, in them there's a disposition. I challenge you, if you don't tithe, ask yourself, where are you on the subject of the love of money? Why don't you? If you've got a bunch of ideas of what you've heard about what people have said about tithing and how it's not in the New Testament, well, you're right, it's not in the New Testament. Jesus, Paul, nobody commanded you to tithe. God in the Old Testament talking to the Hebrews said, bring all the tithes into my house that there may be food in my house and, and prove me and I will open to you the window of heaven. I'll rebuke the devourer and this is a command. And would you rob me? God said you are cursed with a curse. That's to the Old Testament Jew. 
It bothers me when I hear pastors tell churches that you are robbing God if you don't tithe. Particularly that you are cursed if you don't tithe. You are robbing God if you don't tithe. Robbing him only of the ability to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. But specifically, you cannot curse what God has blessed. How can I, out of my mouth, say God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing and then come right behind that and says God cursed you because you didn't pay your tithes last week. So now when you give, you give out of compel, out of compulsion and you give it reluctantly. Think that if you don't tithe, God's going to break your stuff. What kind of God would that be? He says, each must decide in their heart what they want to give. If you want to give God 1%, give God 1% and be glad about it, right? He says, if you give 1%, you're going to get a return back based on 1%. If you decide to give 5%, come on, you're going to get a return back based on 5%. But if you decide, like so many have, that God, because you have been so good in my life, I am going to honor you with 10%. and cause blessing to rest upon your life. Amen. 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 That was extra. That was for free. If you want to keep from loving money, just be generous. It doesn't even have to be in the church. Just be generous. Just constantly give to others and help and support. Amen. And then the last thing is don't love money and don't love things. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, to do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it. If you want to keep from loving money, then don't love stuff. Matter of fact, change how you talk about stuff. You know, you shouldn't be able to say and mean the same. I love God, I love my spouse, I love my family, I love my house. I love my couch, I love my TV, I love pizza, I love my dog. How can love mean anything from pizza to God? What does the Bible say? Don't love the world or the things that are in this world. That means don't love your house, don't love your car, don't love your dog. You can really like them. But be a doer of the word. Don't love stuff. Why? Because loving stuff is loving money or the result of it. Did y'all get anything out of this today? Man, oh man. 